Hi guys and welcome to the last lesson, the fifth lesson in our chapter on grain-based spirits or grain-based spirits overview. So in this chapter we have discussed the differences between grain-based spirits, the differences between moonshine whiskey and vodka. We've looked at the history of whiskey and whiskey. We've looked at regional differences or the legislation of whiskey in different countries. We've spoken about the grain-based spirit methodology. And now finally we're going to talk about innovating with whiskey. How do I make a unique and different whiskey within the law? Can't break the law if it's a commercial product, but um, how how within the law can we make and innovate with whiskey? Now, again, as I said right in the beginning of this chapter, we are going to focus here specifically on South African law. What are we allowed to do under South African law to innovate with whiskey? You need to see which of these techniques I now uh, mention here is applicable to your legislation in your country. So we have to work within the law. Obviously, if you're a home distiller, you can watch this and you can do whatever you want because um, there's no rules. As a home distiller, just don't poison anybody, but otherwise you can make what you want. Just don't sell the product as well, but you can make what you want, use whatever technique you want. That's fine. It's legal. No issues. But commercially, we have to stick within the law. Now, if you really want to play around with whiskeys um, and try different whiskeys and try different recipes, or let's say you, you want to... Just you're looking for some inspiration. Um, a lot of guys turn to the internet for this and they Google whiskey recipe and they get like 5 million hits. Now, most of those recipes are not worth the pixels on your screen. Purely because there is certain basic information that must be contained in a whiskey recipe for you so that if you follow that recipe, what comes out the other side taste the same as the way it was intended by the person that wrote that recipe. Now, what on earth do I mean? Let's look at a credible source of information. If you're looking for recipes that you can actually follow, I highly recommend you find this book called Alt Whiskey. stands for Alternative Whiskies. It was written by the guys in from Corsair Distillery. Now, Corsair Distillery is a craft distillery in America. And again, guys, I'm, I'm not punting one brand over the other or advertising one over the other. This is just guys, people that I've dealt with and come into contact with and that I'm aware of. And that's why I mention them, because they suit the, the topic under discussion. Um, so Corsair Distillery is known for the fact that they make weird and interesting whiskies. They, they play around. They dare to be different. Uh, they, for instance, they've got a pumpkin smoke moonshine where they uh, uh, basically burn or caramelize pumpkin seeds underneath the grain and that pumpkin smoke then infuses into the grain and then when they use that grain in the whiskey, um, the smoke or the, that smoky pumpkin seed flavor comes back into the final product again. I mean, that's, that's weird. That's different. I mean, I don't know of anybody who's ever done anything like that before they did it. So they are trendsetters. They are, they dare to be different. They push the boundaries and they see what, what can work and what doesn't work. And in this book, Alt Whiskies, they've put together a whole bunch of recipes that things they tried that they didn't go commercial. I think there's some of the things in there that they did go commercial with. So there's whiskies there from alternative grains, things like spelt and millet, whiskies from microbrew ales, whiskey from microbrew lagers, so basically whiskies made by uh, in cooperation with craft breweries, uh, hopped whiskies, obviously also from beer, flavored whiskies like wormwood flavor, elderflower, chamomile whiskey, um, which is not legal in South Africa, but in some countries it might be. There's a cannabis whiskey recipe, but probably pot distilled uh, whiskey, smoked grain whiskies, as I mentioned, the pumpkin seed smoke. Now, there's a lot of different recipes in there. And these are some of, I'm not saying it's 100% perfect recipes um, in terms of the amount of information shared, but it is better than most. There is a lot of very specific information in these recipes. And the information needs to be specific because as we've mentioned now a lot of times, you make one small change in your production process, in your recipe, and that's going to completely change the quality of the fermentation, therefore the quality of the distillation, therefore the quality of the final product. Not just, and when I say quality, it doesn't just mean quality as in it's good or it's bad. I mean quality as in its composition, as in the flavor profile and the compounds actually present in that flavor profile. What are you drinking? What are you tasting? What are you smelling? All of these will be affected by small changes, small variables within the entire production process. The bare minimum 
that a whiskey recipe should contain, in my humble opinion, is the following. Firstly, the grain bowl, the entire grain bowl, the quantity and types of grains to use, very specific, down to the cultivar specific. Now, I can't just say maize. What maize? There's many, many different types of maize. So, what cultivar, what quantity of maize or grain should be used? The quantity and type of malt to be used. Not all malts are equal. Not all barley malts. Just looking at malts, that's, that's one grain. Just looking at barley malt. Thanks to the craft brewing industry, we have choices coming out of our ears. Back in the day, in South Africa, malted barley was malted barley. It was pale malt. That was all we had. SAB maltsters supplied pale malt, and that's it. That's all you had. And then craft beer became a thing in South Africa. Now we've got coffee malt. We've got chocolate malt. We've got dark malt. We've got light malt. We've got caramel malt. We've got every type of malt that you can think of. And I'm not even mentioning peated malts, which is obviously in Scottish-style whiskey is a, is a thing all on its own. So, depending on what malt you're using, it's going to completely change the characteristic of the product you are producing. So, if your recipe just says malt, you can throw it away. What malt? Be specific. What type of malt and what quantity of malt is being used? The treatment of the grain or the malt prior to use. As I mentioned, now, all these things that we can do with malts, all the different uh, malting processes and roasting processes and kilning processes and so forth we can apply to malt, can be applied to other grains as well. So did I do something with this grain prior to use or not? And if, even if I just did it to the malt, I need to know what did I do to that malt that might affect the flavor profile. The quantity and type of other enzymes. If I'm adding concentrated enzymes, my recipe must specify what enzymes. It can't just say add alpha amylase. It can't just say add glucoamylase. Because what brand are you using? Because depending on the brand of enzyme that you're using, the protocols might be different. The conversion temperatures might be different. The conversion time might be different. The dosage might be different. So you need to specify what brand and then what quantity and types. Your brewing instructions, all the steps to brew your distiller's beer. Now, in the practical that we, uh, videos, we will show you a starch conversion process, a fermentation process. It's not the only one in the world. There are many, many, many different types of ways to do a starch, uh, ways to do a starch conversion or to make a distiller's beer. So you need to choose what, which one will work best for you. The recipe needs to specify every step in this process. It can't just say make a beer. How? How you make a beer? will uh, impact on the flavor profile. The inside, the steps to brew the distillers beer, the temperatures and time durations for the conversion, which would be impacted by the quantity and type of enzymes that you're using. That needs to be specified. The original SG, the original specific gravity or original bricks that you should have at the end of the conversion. A recipe needs to give you checks and balances. It needs to tell you that at the end of this conversion, you should have a Brix of 18, argument's sake. So that if you don't have a Brix of 18, either it's too high or too low, you know something went wrong. Something is not matching up. Something in your the way you executed the recipe is not the way it was supposed to happen because uh, in the eyes of the person that wrote the recipe. So something is different. If you don't have those checks and balances, you won't know. The yeast, your quantity and type of yeast to use. Every yeast that you use will create a different flavor profile. At this league, we stock roughly 16, I think, different types of yeast strains. I'm not sure if they're all available at the moment, but um, we, of now our total catalog, we have about 16 different yeast strains. Um, two of them are for whiskey. There's a pot still whiskey, or oh, sorry, there's whiskey from barley, which is meant specifically for single malt barley whiskies, and there's whiskey from grain, which is specifically for mixed grain bowl uh, whiskies. That's two whiskey recipes, in the, uh, whiskey yeasts. In the world, there's hundreds, different strains, different styles, uh, different combinations. People are now combining yeasts. 
Um, Scottish Lowlands whiskey distilleries, quite a few of them, are experimenting with South African Sauvignon Blanc yeast strains in conjunction or using to use together with the standard Speyside whiskey yeasts. And the reason why they're incorporating the Sauvignon Blanc yeast strains in there as well is to bring out more grassy and fruity notes inside their whiskey fermentations. Now, if you're starting combining yeast, that opens up a whole new world of experimentation. Um, just a side note on there. Uh, slightly off topic but if you do combine yeast strains it is very important that you look at the kill factors of the two yeast strains they need to be in line they need to have similar kill factors now you'll remember we've discussed uh, kill factors in the introduction to distilling during a fermentation overview where we talked about sterilization and that if you choose to not sterilize, you have to use a yeast with a high kill factor so that it outcompetes the wild yeast, the natural yeast, and other bacteria. Now, this competition factor plays a role when you're pitching two types of yeast as well. Because if you are combining, let's say, a Speyside whiskey yeast with a Lallemand or an Anchor Sauvignon Blanc yeast, now you're combining these two together. If the, sp uh, the whiskey yeast has a higher kill factor, it's going to overpower the Sauvignon Blanc yeast and you're going to find more of those whiskey type flavors, not enough of the wine type flavor profiles contributed. So they need to have equal kill factors so that they compete equally during the fermentation process. So that's just a little bit off point, but important information. But the quantity and type of yeast or yeasts in this case needs to be specified. If you're going to use a completely different type of yeast, the product is going to be completely different. Your fermentation process. Firstly, what type of fermentation? Is it a mash fermentation or a wort fermentation? It's going to have a huge impact. If the recipe was supposed to be done as a mash fermentation, where you get all that flavor extraction from the grain during the fermentation process, and you go and do a wort fermentation, it's going to taste completely different. It's going to have a much lower flavor profile, and you're not going to get the same product out at the end. Your fermentation duration. How long should this fermentation take? Firstly, so that you know it's happening. It's the way it's supposed to. Again, checks and balances. But then also, because that would specify the fermentation temperature. Because the fermentation temperature will determine the length of the fermentation. And along with that, that fermentation temperature and the speed of the fermentation will determine what type of flavors and aromas are formed during the fermentation process. Your target SG, your target specific gravity or your target Brix level at the end of the fermentation. Now normally a distiller would go for zero. We would aim for zero for maximum yield. We don't want to leave sugar behind. We don't want to leave unfermented sugars or residual sugars behind because that's potential alcohol, therefore potential income that we've now wasted. So we would try to avoid that. But sometimes some recipes would call for you to leave some residual sugars behind, either for a taste effect, but more commonly to avoid putting the yeast under stress where it could start generating off flavors and off uh, aromas in the fermentation process. So your recipe might need to specify that. Your distillation process. Now that can be a lot of different things put in there. You have to use this type of still, you have to do that and so on. But for the most part, the most important thing that has to be specified in the distillation process would be your target ABV percentage. For what percentage either specific ferment percentage in the case of an adjustable reflux column store or percentage range of ABV percentage should you aim for. What's your cuts? What percentage to what percentage should be your hard cut? Or at what percentage do you keep the still running if it's an adjustable reflux column still? Because that percentage, that ABV percentage, that proof will impact your flavor profile. And some guys go in a lot more detail here, um, where they actually talk about certain temperatures for the cuts and that type of thing, or certain percentages for the cuts, but you need to be careful now. Because as we've previously discussed, temperatures will depend on various factors. And even though, yes, you've taken one variable out of the equation because you're using a very, very specific fermentation recipe, that does not change the fact that your location would be different. Your height above sea level is different. There are still other factors that contribute to temperatures. So temperatures are dangerous. Don't quote temperatures, or if you're quoting temperatures or putting temperatures in the fermentation, make sure it is linked to a location or a certain height above sea level. Otherwise, it's useless information. Volume, same thing. Be careful with those type of things. And then finally, your aging instructions. 
your barrel size, obviously, because the larger the barrel, the longer it takes to get impart woodiness and flavor. The smaller the barrel, the faster that goes. The aging period, obviously, also linked to the barrel size. So the smaller the barrel, the shorter period of time it will stay in the, uh, in the barrel. The larger the barrel, the longer it will stay inside the barrel. And don't ask me to give you a linear correlation of how many days in a 10 liter is the equivalent to how many years in a 700 liter. It doesn't work like that. There is no linear correlation. I, there's no math behind this. If there was, believe me, I would have created a spreadsheet already that would be available for download on our website. There is no way to work that up. It is taste and impression. There's just too many variables to try to predict that accurately. Type of wood of the barrel plays a big role. Um, American oak versus French oak. There is a slight color change, or well, slight flavor and aroma change there, but not so big that you're going to big, really notice it. But once you start playing around with other types of woods, uh, apple wood, cherry wood, pear wood, etc., 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 those woods will give a completely different flavor profile uh, to the final product. Also, the wood treatment and level of treatment will uh, impact on the flavor profile. Is it a charred barrel or is it a toasted barrel? Charred, much more intense flavor profile than a toasted barrel. And, and both versus charred versus toasted, there's different levels as well. Toasting, there's three levels of light, medium, or, or heavy toast. Char, there's four levels, starting from a light char up to, uh, all the way to alligator skin char. We're going to talk about charring in much more detail at the, in the spirit enhancement section of this course, or of this section of the comprehensive distilling course. So, this will also impact on the flavor profile. And one that I didn't even mention here, uh, but would be quite obvious, I would think, is the previous use of the wood. Um, is it a virgin American oak barrel? Is it a first full barrel, second full barrel? Is it an ex-sherry barrel? Is it an export barrel? Is it a wine barrel? Because whatever was in that barrel before, those flavors and aromas will then impact on the product that comes out of the barrel. And this is the bare minimum of information that must be in a whiskey recipe, or in any recipe for that matter, for you to get anywhere close to the product tasting the same way as the author of the recipe intended. These are also the bare minimum of things that you should be keeping record of when you're doing product development, because these are the factors that will most influence your product. So if you're not recording these, you're not doing proper product development because you don't have any information to build on. Now, within this framework, and keeping in mind, as per our previous discussions on the legislation of South Africa and what we're allowed to do and required to do under South African law, how do we innovate with whiskey? How do we make a unique and different whiskey? Because the problem we, as we've discussed in our W1 Brandy and Mampur course or fruit-based spirits course, uh, or in the fruit-based spirit section of our uh, comprehensive distilling course, one of the big challenges we discussed there is the fact that with brandy in South Africa, we are not able to innovate. The law doesn't allow for innovation because the law is too strict. We can't play around. South African whiskey law is still strict, but it allows us to play around a bit more. Now, how do we do this? Now, the variables of whiskey, the things that we can play around with to, to change the whiskey, starts firstly with the grains and malts. Think back now. South African liquor law, the definition of whiskey in South Africa for uh, both whiskey and blended wh uh, whiskey um, and malt uh, whiskey, says grain. The word barley does not appear under, in South African liquor law. It does not appear there. Even under malt whiskey, it, does, it says malt, it doesn't say barley. So we are allowed in South Africa to use any grain. I can make a single malt rye whiskey. I can make a single uh, malt wheat whiskey. I can make um, uh, sp uh, spelt whiskey, millet whiskey. I can use any grain. There's a client in Free State making teff whiskey, horse feed whiskey. Um, you can use any grain can be used legally in South Africa to make a whiskey. So playing around with your grain either individually or as a combination in the mixed grain bill, you can completely change the quality of your whiskey, the attributes of your whiskey. You can make a completely different style of whiskey by using a unique grain that somebody else hasn't done before. Sorghum whiskey, for instance. That would, what would be more South African than the sorghum whiskey? So playing around with that grain and the f uh, 
really pivoting the flavor of that grain and the marketing potential, but the flavor of that grain, allowing that flavor to express itself in the whiskey will make for a unique and different product legally. The treatment of the grains and the malts. Again, there's nothing in South African law that says we're not allowed to do something with the grain before it, or the malt before it. And they can't say that it's, no, it's implicit or it's implied or anything like that, because then peated whiskey would be legal in South Africa. Because peated whiskey, the malt is treated beforehand. So why would they, why is it allowed in a peated whiskey, but it's not allowed in any other type of whiskey? The argument does not hold. So there's nothing in the law that says we cannot do something with the grain before it. So by smoking the grain, by uh, roasting the grain, by doing something to the grain beforehand, to affect, which will affect the flavor of the grain, that would be legal. We can do something to the grain beforehand and use it that way. Doing a mash versus a wort fermentation. Most whiskies in South Africa are made, if not all, are made from wort fermentations. So just by leaving the grains in during the fermentation process, just by doing a mash fermentation and extracting more flavors from the grain, you're already going to have a higher grain flavor profile in the whiskey. It's already going to taste different. It's already going to taste unique. So that's already a plus. That's already a win. My yeast type. More subtle, yes, but it can have a big effect. So playing around with your yeast that you're using, as long as Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Saccharomyces bionis, which is the two uh, families of yeast that is allowed to be used under South African law, then you're, you're fine. You can use any strain that, uh, that falls under those two groupings. You can use any strain, and they will all give slightly different flavor profiles. So as I say, yes, it would be more subtle. Um, people will really need to know what they're doing to really taste that difference. But it is something you can play around with. Your fermentation temperature plays a role. As we said, hot and dirty versus slow and slow. You can do a quick and dirty fermentation. Go for those carboxylic esters and other compounds that, find, oh, that form a hot and dirty fermentation and see what effect does that have on your um, uh, final product. And again, there's nothing in the law that specifies at what temperature it must ferment. Don't play around with that. The distilled ABV percentage. South African law merely states that whiskey must be distilled between, uh, below 94% ABV. That's all it says. Must be distilled below 94% ABV. As we discussed in legislation, it's ridiculous. That's completely ridiculous. That's vodka already. But that's the only percentage me mentioned. That and the fact that in the bottle it must be a minimum of 43%. That's the only percentage mentioned in terms of the strength of the, of the whiskey. So, if you were to distill your whiskey at 65%, you're going to have a lot more flavor and a lot more grain flavor in your product than a whiskey which is distilled at the normal percentages, which range between 70 and 85. And you're going to definitely have a hell of a lot more uh, flavor than a whiskey distilled above 90, as the mass-produced products would be in continuous stills. So playing around with that percentage will determine how much flavor you have, because the higher the purity, the lower the flavor profile. The lower the purity, the higher the flavor profile. So you can play around with that distillation percentage. Not so much in, let's put it, less room to play in, under U.S. legislation or some of the other countries, but something you can play with. Your barreling ABV percentage. Putting it in the barrel at different percentages will uh, impact how much flavor and what flavors and how much color is extracted from the barrel. Because the higher the percentage going into the barrel, more solvent, you're going to extract more. Lower the percentage, less solvent, you're going to extract less. Something you can play with. Your barrel wood type, as we've mentioned before, are you just going to stick with oak, either French or American, or are you actually going to play around with unique uh, woods and different woods? We actually have a craft cooperage opening up um, now in South Africa, um, where they will be making barrels to spec, to four clients who specify size, type of wood, and so on and so forth. Um, that's great. That's now suddenly we can now play around with different woods legally in a barrel form. We can play around with different types of woods. Where guys previously had just been doing it with chips and staves and so on on a home level or hobby level, but now we can play around. Uh, barrel wood treatment, charring versus um, toasting, but there's also smoking. There's a distillery in, I think, in Australia, if I remember correctly, that burns tobacco leaves inside the barrels where that tobacco smoke, uh, smoke infuses into the wood. And when they then use that, on, they use it on a rum, but it's besides the point. When they then use that barrel on their spirit, that tobacco flavors gives back into the spirit again. Why not? Nothing in the Lord says we can't do it. So why not play around? Is there something you can do with your barrel to add flavor during the barreling process? 
the previous use of the barrel. Um, was it, is it a, a virgin oak barrel? Is it the second full barrel that there's already been bourbon in there? Um, was it previously used for pinotage, for wine? Was it used maybe for um, uh, sherry or port or some kind of fortified wine, a muscadel maybe? What was in that barrel beforehand? I even had a client, I have no idea how it came out. It was a very weird ask, but he had an old uh, small balsamic vinegar barrel. And he wanted to use that for the spirits. I told him I had my doubts how it would come out. I didn't think it would come out very nice. But hell, if you know, as long as you're not wasting alcohol, try it. See what happens. Who knows? It might be something uh, that never, nobody's ever thought of before. So the previous use of the barrel will have an impact as well. And then finally, the barrel aging period. How long was it in that barrel? Um, South African law says minimum three years, there's no maximum. So you can put it in for a longer period and see what happens. But common wisdom says that with everything that's going to happen is going to happen in the first eight years so anything longer than that does not really uh, make, a, make an impact not for the average consumer they're not going to taste the difference um, a connoisseur or master blender might taste the difference but most other consumers won't but those those are our variables those are the things that we can play around with legally under South African law in order to innovate and uh, change the way we present the products. So my message basically is, and this is just to wrap up the chapter of uh, Grain Spirit Overview, is dare to be different. Ch challenge convention. Challenge tradition. Don't just copy what everybody else is doing. If you want to be, especially if you're going to go commercial, and especially if you want to be a successful commercial craft distiller, you need to start a stand out from the pack. You need to draw attention to yourself. Your product, your branding, your story, everything plays a role here. And a lot of these things you can turn into marketing stories. You can turn it into factors that makes you stand out from the crowd. And the more innovative you can be, the more you're going to stand out. But you must do so within the law. You can't just do whatever you want, uh, and it might make for a great product, it might make for a great story, but if it's illegal, you're not going to get very far in any case. As a home, it's still the same thing. Don't try to copy your favorites, whatever they might be, because what's the point? Why would you want to copy something that's already in existence? You want to make something that's unique. You want to make something that's different. You want to make something that will impress people. You want to make something that's innovative. So You want to make something that you personally like. So don't copy something because that's what you're used to. Try something new. Experiment and see what comes out the other side. You might be very pleasantly surprised.